Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. All right. Well, welcome in, everyone. It is Thursday. It is November. The leaves have fallen here in Cedar City, and we are doing what we do best at Southern Utah University, which is celebrate our connection to the national parks. Uh, Our Apex event this week featured author and national parks expert Al Runty, and he is here in the studio with me. So welcome in, Al Runty. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Lynn. Good to be here. It's been such a pleasure. We have the great great distinction of being the University of the Parks in Southern Utah University. And so how exciting it has been to really um, dig into your books and dig into the history and share that with our our audience. Um, For those of you who are curious about the books, Al has Allies of the Earth, Railroads and the Soul of Preservation, Trains of Discovery, Western Railroads and the National Parks, National Parks, the American Experience, which we're reading in several of our classes. Yosemite, the embattled wilderness, um, public lands, public heritage, the national forest idea, and Burlington Northern and the dedication of Mount St. Helens, new legacy of a proud tradition. So, Al, you have just written everything about our great lands in the United States. And I'd love to start our conversation by talking about how that came to happen. What drew you to the national parks? Well, to... Go back, way, way back now, to 1959. Uh, My father passed away in 1958, and uh, my mom had my brother and me, and her father had homesteaded in South Dakota. We lived at the time in Binghamton, New York. So mom said, I want to go see where my father homesteaded. I want to go see where your grandfather lived. And while we're out there, I want to go to the national parks. He had just read an article in the Saturday Evening Post about the Tetons and Jackson Hole. So she took our old Chevy station wagon with four retreaded tires. Wow. And uh, we got a Coleman stove. We bought three air mattresses and sleeping bags. And we started west, July 6, 1959. And she drove all the way. My brother and I navigated. We had road maps then. We did not have GPS. We had to know the country Mm -hmm. geographically. So she let us pick the routes, and we went west. And we the major parks we saw that uh, summer were Yellowstone, Tetons, Grand Teton National Park, Crater Lake, Yosemite, and the Grand Canyon. Those were the main ones. We stopped at a lot of other ones along the way. And it stuck. I just I just fell in love with the national parks. So when we got home in August, middle of August of 1959, I started to read more about them. Mm. And was there a lot available to read about them at the time? Not a lot. Mm-hmm. Most of it was magazine articles right, and, right. and that kind of thing. There, there weren't a lot of books. There were a few guidebooks and things, as I recall. There were some some anecdotal types of studies, but not anything really serious, mm-hmm. even though it was and fast was becoming one of our major contributions to world civilization. Yeah, right. And then when did you start uh, having the desire to write about the parks? Well, that came in, uh, in college. Uh-huh. Um, when I was in college, I then ran into a book that appeared in 1961, John Eyes, Our National Park Policy, A Critical History, and I wrote about national parks in my sophomore and senior history classes and, again, found out that there wasn't a lot, but I was getting used to the idea of using primary sources, and I started to write. And then I really turned to writing about the parks when I went for my master's degree. My my master's thesis was on the scenic preservation movement, including the national parks from the Civil War through the end of World War One. Yeah. 
And then when I went out to do my doctoral study under Roderick Nash at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, he had written a beautiful book, a beautiful book, Wilderness and the American Mind. I decided I would make my subject the national parks. Mm. And he thought that was a great idea. And then I started really getting into the research. Yeah. And now you even got you have even gotten more into railroads and and that's also a, an area of expertise, but it's linked to the history of the national parks. Oh yeah, railroads were the opening of the parks here in Cedar City. Yeah. The parks were opened by the Union Pacific Railroad. It was mm. critical. Yeah. If the Union Pacific hadn't come in here with the old roads of that period, there would not have been a lot of tourists. Right. But the trains came in. Carl Gray of the Union Pacific built the spur track over from Lund which is about 35, 40 miles to the west here, yeah. built it over from the main line right into Cedar City so that the trains could come right into town. And uh, your professor, Ryan Paul, knows that story far better than I do. But from there, then people took their, their motor stages on what could be two, three, four, or five-day trips of either Zion, Bryce, Cedar Breaks, and the North Rim of Grand Canyon. And it was it was very popular. It was a seasonal business, very much a seasonal business, right. but it was very popular, very well received, mm-hmm. and uh, and and so it all grew up from there here in Utah. Yeah, and the railroads were also very very important in the northern part, um, and and the hotels and industry were kind of built up around those stops to get people oh, there. Yeah. That's kind of. Can you talk a little bit more oh, about? Yeah, that? they built all the ho- they built all the hotels, all the lodges. Yeah, hired all the top architects of the period. To, to do the um, to do the designs and to pre- prepare the hotels and they, they did it almost well they did it at a loss yeah P- few people today can understand that why would the railroads lose money developing the parks right well because they made money on the passenger trains bringing people to the parks <laughs> and if the parks could at least break even or slightly underneath even then they would uh, be happy to uh, to have the hotel. So here they hired the famous Los Angeles architect, Gilbert Stanley Underwood, to design the lodges. And they're gorgeous lodges, as you know. Yeah. Especially the one at the north rim of the Grand Canyon, where it just looks right out into the abyss. That's my favorite. Yeah, just right over it's it. Just, it's just, and then they had the cabins surrounding the lodges. Yeah. People came to the lodges to sit and talk yeah. and to have dinner. Mm-hmm. Today, you go into many hotels, they don't have lobbies. Right. They'll, people don't talk to one another anymore. Yeah. Where's the takeout? Yeah. Where's the Papa John's pizza? You know? Uber okay. Eats. <laughs> Uber Eats, yeah. And uh, so it was all built around community. It was a different age in that regard. Yeah. 100 years ago was a very different age, but the railroads were very, very instrumental. Yeah. I'd always loved trains. I, I was a kid. I modeled railroad. I did all of that. But when I found out how critical the railroads were, to the development of the parks, it gave me a real opportunity to write something new about the parks. Yeah. And just as Ryan Paul continues that story with Sing Away, his magnificent new book out from Zion Forever. Right. And uh, it, um, it gave me an opportunity to remind people that corporations were critical in the development of the national parks. And so key that they, it was corporations, like you were saying, not necessarily banking on a profit at that moment, going in for a loss. It seems like an insane business proposition now. I can't imagine anyone going in with that idea, but they were thinking about the long term and the money that they can make and, and all of the jobs and everything like that. It's fascinating. Right. We've, we've lost so much going from the annual business report to the quarterly business report and to the share by a penny on the Wall Street Stock Exchange. It was not that way 100 years ago. Corporations were there to make money, and they were there to make a lot of money. But they still had that sense of noblesse oblige. They still had that sense of obligation to the society that is very much missing today. Airlines today will give you all this stuff about how how much they love their country and and then they'll stick you in that little seat, yeah. <laughs> jam you in and tell you, well, it's for your own good. Well, what, what they're really saying to you is we want to pack as many people into this as we can. Yeah. On a train, you had dining cars, sleeping cars, lounge cars, dome cars, space. The railroads gave you space and you could move around. Yeah. The kids could go up and down the train and get their energy burned off. Now they have to sit in the seat and kick the seat in front of them and cry. You know? I know. And, and, 
And so it was, it was a different age. Yeah. Do you think that there's any way, I mean, I, I sort of meant to start our conversation at the beginning, but already I've gotten to where things are now. Do you, do you think that there's any way to recapture any of that back or recapture, like you were mentioning, the opportunity for conversation and interaction like the hotels had? Do you think that the parks can be our way back to our humanity? Well, in some ways, they already are, because when people go into those old hotels, the architecture and the floor plans do instruct them to slow down. Mm. If you go to Glacier today in that marvelous hotel there, the Glacier Park Lodge or Many Glacier Hotel, or even here Grand Canyon or Zion or anywhere, you will find people sitting and talking again. Yeah. And and one of the nice things is when there's no cell phone reception, then they have to talk. <laughs> right. And they have to see what's going on with one another in person rather than on, online, as we say. Right. But it's it's going it's going to take a while, I think, to turn ourselves around. I'm hoping that we're at the point now where we're where we're jaded to this and we start to bring our railroads back and bring good public transportation back. The Europeans have never lost their great no, public transportation. No, so true, so true. And we did. Yeah. And wouldn't it be marvelous again if Union Pacific trains came back into Cedar City? Oh, that with would passengers be. and took people to the parks. I would love it. In open air jitneys again, like in the old days where the people had to sit and talk. Now you get into what I call as a corporate bus. It has one door, right. and everybody queues up fifty people in a line. While somebody old and infirm like myself clambers up the stairs and slows everybody down. And those old open air motor stages, basically by the white company, everybody had a side door that slipped into a bench seat. Mm -hmm. Three or four people on a bench seat. You boarded and you unloaded in seconds. Yeah. Now it takes you five minutes, 10 minutes to load the bus. That's true. Oh my gosh. So. Well, that's great to sort of get a sense of, you know, how how things are now and how we can get back to it. Um, when we come back from our musical break, I'd love to talk about, I have some questions from the book about some specific things that really caught my attention. But first, it's time for a little bit of a musical break. Um, so everybody's wondering what I chose for music this time. And if anybody's interested in the music for the show, just a reminder that all of the songs that I've played are on our website, su.edu slash apex. And you can go to the podcast and there's an open playlist called Played on Apex Hour. Uh, today's music, I am just enamored uh, with um, many people have been watching this new show called The Queen's Gambit, which is on Netflix. And shout out to my dear friend, Carlos Rivera. Carlos, who is a great composer based out of Miami and was a fellow USC alum with me. We were in school together. He um, is the composer for all the music on The Queen's Gambit. And uh, it's just wonderfully alluring music. He, in an interview, talked about how the music was originally supposed to be all piano. Um, the director wanted it to be all piano, but as the main character's world expands, it made sense to sort of expand the sound palette and uh, and the orchestration. So um, this is the song title is te technically Training with Mr. Scheibel, uh, and it's part of the Queen's Gambit soundtrack scored by Carlos Rivera. You're listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1.
All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. You're listening to the Apex Hour, uh, KSUU, Thunder 91.1. This is Lynn Vartan. That song was Training with Mr. Scheibel. It's part of this uh, original score soundtrack to The Queen's Gambit, written for my written by my dear friend Carlos Rivera. Um, today, we are talking about the National Barks, and I'd like to welcome back into the studio, Al Runty. Welcome back. Good to be back. So I wanted to talk about some of the early stages of the parks. Um, uh, and, and Niagara was kind of one of the first experiments, if you will. Is, is that how you would kind Well, of Niagara it? Falls was the first poor example, if you will, the first, right. the first example to American intellectuals and artists that we had a problem. Niagara was the place that every artist of the early 19th century had to go. You had to paint Niagara. Yeah. You had to try to capture its water. Yeah. And it was it was very, very hard to do. But hundreds of artists tried and thousands of paintings were produced. And not until Frederick Church in 1857 did we have a painting that could really be called Niagara. He got it. He finally, he nailed it. And he had talent, obviously, beyond all of his predecessors to nail it. But by the time he nailed it, the falls had been nailed by tour sharks, by by people who were selling the Niagara Falls experience. Yeah. And that meant that they roped off and gated off and fenced off areas around the falls and sold you access to the brink. Yeah. And to put it bluntly, Niagara Falls by the 1850s, already looked like an urban slum. Yeah. It was full of shacks and shanties and privies, and people don't know what privies are anymore, but out, outdoor outhouses, as they were yeah. called, and old hotels and all that kind of thing. And American intellectuals were roundly embarrassed, among them Frederick Law Olmsted, the designer of Central Park in New York. And, and Europeans let us know about it. Mm -hmm. You say that you are the future because... You have a beautiful landscape. And look what you're doing to it. Alexis de Tocqueville urges his mother to hasten to Niagara if you wish to see this place in its grandeur. Mm -hmm. If you delay, your Niagara will have been spoiled for you yeah. because people were destroying it. So it made, it forced people to take a look. And before they took a serious look, the whole rim of the cataract, both the American and Canadian sides, was gone, mm -hmm. had fallen into private hands. And that would lead to a separate campaign for Niagara in the 1870s and 80s that would eventually result in a small state park to preserve access to the rim. Mm -hmm. But Niagara Falls was on everybody's mind when they went west. Mm -hmm. Is this what's going to happen when, when, when they found Yosemite? Is that going to be another Niagara, private landowners fencing it all off and charging visitors a fee? And it became the basis of the report of Ferdinand V. Hayden to Congress on recommending Yellowstone as a public park. If we don't hurry, visitors will be charged a fee for the site of that of which ought to be as free as the air or water. Mm -hmm. So Niagara became the example of what not to do right. and what not to allow. And Niagara had never really recovered. I mean, even now the water is managed, right? Oh, yeah. It doesn't flow freely. Oh, yeah. Niagara historically was 200,000 cubic feet a second. That's, I don't know, several million gallons. I forget exactly. It was huge. It was thunderous. Yeah. You could hear it 30, 40, 50 miles away. Feel it in the ground. Now they've they put up shant, uh, sh uh, jetties into the water to keep the water flowing faster as it comes to the brink. But fully one half of that 200,000 cubic feet is diverted around the falls during daylight viewing hours. And after midnight, it's only 25,000 cubic feet a second which means Niagara is just a trickle over the rocks yeah. compared to. And then when the tourists come back, they turn it back on again. So where is the water gone? It's gone into big reservoirs downstream. It, it bypasses the falls entirely and is stored in these big reservoirs to be used throughout daylight hours for power production downstream in the Niagara Gorge. So Niagara Falls is, is a power plant, a scenic power plant. And then there's all the wax museums and firecracker shops and right. hotels and restaurants and and towers around it. It's a mess. Yeah. And still 7 million people a year go there. 
Yeah, it's so interesting. I, first of all, before reading the book, I didn't realize that they turned Niagara on and off. So that was like a complete surprise to me. And, and then of course, the, the, the tourist trap aspect of it. Right. I was really curious, um, in reading the book, uh, other people, parks flirted with this concept over the years. Um, for example, I'm remembering the the fire embers that that got thrown oh, yeah. over. The fire fall in Yosemite, yeah. The firefall. Can yeah. you talk that that was sort of a, a foray into mm. a tourist attraction. Oh yeah. What was that like? Well David Curry and his wife Jenny were the founders of Camp Curry beneath Glacier Point in Yosemite. And back in the 1870s at one fourth of July a James McCauley, who had built the trail to Glacier Point, uh, threw fireworks off the cliff to celebrate. You can imagine how they boomed off the off the walls. Actually, yeah. they were sticks of dynamite. And apparently, he kicked the fire off afterwards, and people down below said, hey, that was cool, Jim, the fire coming over. That was the best part. So it became known as the fire fall. Somebody would go up there and build a pile of embers, usually paid by somebody in the valley. And then when David and Jenny Curry started their camp right below Glacier Point, they thought, what a neat marketing gimmick, right? Yeah. We'll have the fire fall. And they they started this. It was extremely popular. And they they get guests to chip in to hire somebody to go up and cut all the bark and wood for this huge bonfire that they would then push off at, at darkness with a rake. Usually went off the side at 9 p.m. sharp every night in summer months. And people and, – and, and David Curry had his big megaphone and he'd lean back. It's 3,200 feet and he'd yell up, hello, Glacier Point, Camp Curry, let the fire fall. Wow. And so when he got into trouble with the managers in the valley, with the commission, and then later with the military, and then later with the park service, they'd abolish the fire fall. And he'd go back to Washington, D.C. with petitions in hand and get it restarted again. And it managed to survive until 1968 when finally the Park Service had to say, this is it. The, the Valley is just now a freak show. And I saw it in 1959. Oh, you my, did? My, two nights. Two nights. It, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it wasn't for the Valley. Right. Right. But it's the same thing in Niagara Falls, the light show, yeah. the dazzling, the colors and all that stuff. It's all artificial. I didn't realize it went that late to 1968. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. It survived almost a century. Wow, that's incredible. And there were other things, uh, sort of scheduled bear feedings, I think I read Oh, yeah, about. they had bear feedings. They get 500 people a night at the bear feeding shows in Yellowstone. They did that in Yosemite, too. They charged people 25 cents to sit in the bleachers. And if bears showed up, they'd keep the 25 cents. If bears didn't show up, they'd refund the 25 cents. Really? And these were the ways that the concessionaires made money. Now, I should say that these concessionaires were not the railroads. They didn't want this stuff. These were the concessionaires that wanted volume over substance. And these were the concessionaires that wanted automobile tourists in the 20s to come in. And as you got more automobile travel and fewer railroad passengers, you got more theatrics. Oh, they had an Indian rodeo in Yosemite, Indian field days. Uh, they they had a spotlight on Old Faithful Geyser off of Old Faithful Inn in Yellowstone. And so they did all these things, which were called gilding the lily. Why do you need to do that? Yeah. You're in this beautiful place already. But it was tried, and there are people that still miss it. Oh. They say, oh, I saw the fire fall. It was wonderful. And I saw the bear feeding shows. It was wonderful. <laughs> and I guess I didn't realize that ex that distinction that it wasn't. Um, so the railroad people generally, the railroad corporations, kind of wanted to keep the experience a bit more pure, it sounds like. Well, they wanted to keep it higher class, to put yeah. it bluntly. Yeah. Because they had a higher class of tourists. People had to spend a lot of money to get a railroad ticket to come to Yellowstone. In the early days, I estimate that a railroad ticket from from New York to Yellowstone and back via Chicago would have been about $150 or half a year's pay right. for the average American. Half a year's pay wow. for the average American making 2 or $3 a day. I mean, that's more than, than an around-the-world airline ticket now. Right, right. Wow. So it was very expensive. Very expensive. And you had only five, six, ten thousand 10,000 people a year, even in a good year. Mm -hmm. Now Yellowstone had, had almost 4 million people, even in a COVID year. And that's because of the automobile. Uh -huh. And the automobile is very different from the railroad. The railroad takes you in, and you can't stop along the way. 
but everybody who knows you're coming by car wants to set up a distraction along the road. So as you're driving in, you could have 60, 70 miles of tourist traps. Yeah. I remember in 1959, well, we seen these signs for the snake farm. Oh. The snake farm. And finally, I said to my mom, I want to see the snake farm. So she gave me 50 cents to stop in in the snake farm in Oregon. And the guy apologized. He said, I'm sorry, but our rattlesnake is dead. So. Oh. Our one rattlesnake, Our one rattlesnake. On, the, on the snake farm. Wow. And there's always people out there trying to importune you, yeah. either a high level or a low level. But when you were in the company, you you didn't stop. When you yeah. were in the buses, you didn't stop. But when you're in your own car, you can pull off the road and stop. It just brings up such an interesting uh conflict between, you know, wanting to maintain the land and not have it be overrun, but yet also wanting it accessible to everyone. Right. And and that's one of the main uh, points of conflict today still, right? right? Well, when you go to a ball game, you go to a ball game, right? You, you, you go into Yankee Stadium, you know it's going to be the Yankees playing whomever, and you sit there in this ball game, you don't start screaming for a bear feeding show. Right. And when you, when you go into an art museum, you know there's going to be paintings on the wall, and you're going to be expected to be quiet and not to use your flash on your flash camera. You obey the rules. Right. There's always somebody trying to break the rules and bend the rules. When you go to a national park, you should expect to see nature. You're going to see wild bison in the fields. Why would you want to give them popcorn so they come up next to the road? Yeah. I, I, I mean, this is the kind of thing that we have a park service for to educate people. But unfortunately, a lot of uneducated people, and they're not bad people, but they are uneducated, go to the national parks. And when it doesn't stand on its head— when they're supposed, when, when the effort's supposed to come from them and not from the resource, they don't understand it. Right. How do you feel? I know in in Zion, for example, and in many places, we have um, restricted attendance now. Um, right. And how do? What's your opinion on that? Is that a good thing? Is that a dangerous thing? I know some um, of the public, you know, it gets frustrated with that because they want to go when they want to go on right. their own time. What are your feelings about well, that? Well, there are 421 national parks, monuments, and historical sites. 421. And guess what? The 10 most visited are Zion, Yellowstone, Great Smokies, Glacier, Yosemite, Grand Canyon, of course. Yeah. Hey, good people. There's another 400 plus <laughs> parks out there you can go to. Right. You can go to Navajo National Monument. Nobody there. <laughs> And it's beautiful. Go take some place in that isn't crowded yeah. and take in the crowded spots. That they're, they're really meant to be seen maybe once and twice in a lifetime because of all the numbers that go there. And if we could have restrictions, and we, and we have to move in that direction. I mean, North Rim of the Grand Canyon is so much more beautiful than South Rim because the visitation is one-tenth. Exactly. And there, people aren't crawling all over one another. Yeah. So on the South Rim, let's have restrictions. But remember, the concessionaires don't want restrictions because they, they want to sell you that rubber snake <laughs> since the real rattlesnake is dead. Yeah. <laughs> Well, on that note, it's time for another moment of music. That's fantastic. And um, we are here talking with Al Runty about our national parks and uh, the preservation history and legacy of them. Um, for our musical break, I've been playing music from the Queen's Gambit. Um, this next uh, piece is also from that, and it's uh, the composer's Carlos Rivera. And the name of this song is Playing Beltic. It's one of the chess games that the protagonist plays. And uh, yeah, we'll just have a listen. You're listening to KSUU Thunder 91.1.
Welcome back, everyone. This is the Apex Hour. You're listening to KSU Youth under 91.1. That was another moment from the... Um, uh, from the Queen's Gambit soundtrack written by Carlos Rivera. That song was called Playing Beltic. I am joined in the studio by Al Runty, and we are talking about our national parks. I wanted to talk about the um, importance of artists in the development of our national park system. Um, all throughout your book, um, you know, it's it's mentioned that the 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 painters, the muralists, the photographers um, were such a huge part in getting um, those images to the public um, in the East. And I wondered if you could just share a little bit more about that. Well, let's go way back. Okay. Now we're going way back. I love it. Before there was an internet, before there was movies and radio and television and all these things, there were two ways to be exposed to the world by a third person who'd actually seen it. One was a painting or a drawing, and the other was the literature, yeah. a description of the place. Americans in the 19th century were voracious readers. They had to be because that was the only way that they could get information. And they also loved art because that's the way they got their visual information. So when people began to discover the wonders of earlier, we were talking about Niagara Falls, the artists would go there and make a series of paintings and bring them back to a gallery. There were many more galleries, right. art galleries then, in the cities of America, the big cities especially. And they'd bring them back to the art galleries and people could pass through the art galleries for a few cents, a nickel, 50 cents if it was something really special. And you get into the art gallery and you see these paintings. Now imagine what it was like when Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Moran went west in the 1860s and 70s and started bringing back canvases that were 10 feet high and 12 feet wide or 15 feet wide and, and 12 feet high. Right. And they did. They, they, they were just overwhelmed by the beauties of the West, and so they cut their canvas by the yard instead of by the foot, whereas the Eastern painters were usually making more modest paintings, three and four feet, but still at all, beautiful, beautiful paintings of the Hudson River Valley, of the Catskill Mountains, all these wonderful places. Yeah. And the people of wealth of the period were the patrons. They were the ones that bought the art and put it up in their living room walls, painting of the Hudson River or Cottesville Falls in the Catskills or one of these places. And it, it, was, it was very popular. But that, that was how you saw the world. That was the only way you could see it unless you were seeing it with your own eyes. So it was art was critical to the national parks because it was the way that Congress first saw Yellowstone, for example, right. and first saw Yosemite. They had the full folio uh, pictures of Carlton Watkins for the Yosemite legislation. They had the artist studies of Thomas Moran and the photographs of William Henry Jackson for Yellowstone on display in the Capitol Rotunda as they were deliberating the, the bill in the winter of 1871-72. So they were able to see what they were talking about, what was being talked about. And then they had the descriptions from the magazines of the explorers who had actually been there and who actually testified and wrote descriptions for the United States Congress. Wow. So it wasn't as if anybody was in the dark. Yeah. But no, they, were, they weren't texting. Right. And they weren't on their cell phones. And they weren't in a movie theater or a television studio. Yeah. It was all, it was all two dimensional. Yeah. And it was basically paintings and photography and again, the literature. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of the, the guidebooks? Um, because I think that's also something that we don't um, necessarily have so much anymore. Um, but these guidebooks that would co sort of uh, help with the visit or uh, right. be descriptive about the visit along with the, the artwork. Right. Let's, let's do a Western on this one. Okay. Let's say we're going west on the Oregon Trail. Okay. Did we do a John Wayne style? Wagons, yo. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> we bought a guidebook. Yeah. We bought a guidebook and it described Ford by Ford and River Valley by River Valley and Mountaintop by Mountaintop what the Oregon Trail was and what you were going to encounter on it. The hardest thing about the Oregon Trail 
was to be able, again, to afford it, to afford the oxen of the horses and the wagon. But once you got on it, after a couple, three years, it was 10 miles wide. You couldn't miss it. It was not just a pathway through the wilderness. 60, 80,000 people grazing their livestock across the West from, from Missouri to Oregon left quite a swath, left, left quite a trail. Yeah. So people read the guidebooks. They didn't hire wagon masters. Right. They didn't hire John Wayne. Well, what about the Indians? Well, the Indians wanted to trade with you. They didn't want to attack you. Uh There were very, very few deaths from Indian attack along the trail, and usually they were individual wagons that were stragglers or things of that kind. You didn't go attacking three or 400 settlers. You didn't circle the wagons. They were armed to the teeth. Well, bring this now to the parks. Same thing. Guidebooks were produced. And people went out there. That was how they made money. Yeah. James Mason Hutchings had his Hutchings California magazine. He could tell you everything, see and where to go before the gold rush had even ended. Right. And the same with the Yosemite. Guidebook writers went in there by the late 1860s. There were several, including guidebooks by Josiah Dwight Whitney, who was on the California Commission that managed the, the park for the federal government. And it was called the Yosemite Book. And he had a popular version which was cheap and an expensive version with lots of gorgeous folio pictures from Carlton Watkins. And and the guidebooks were, were all over the place. And the parks even were part of uh, political cartoons. I mean, they as as the topic became more and more prevalent in society, and as the conflict and uh, as it still remains, um, they they seem to be just everywhere in in the national dialogue, uh, including political cartoons. Well, sure, and, and the reason again is because they were our culture. Yeah, they were our cultural icons. The parks distinguished us from Europe big time. Europe didn't have a Yellowstone, didn't have a Yosemite. Right. They had a Lauterbrunnen, which is a glorious valley. And I've been there a couple of times in the Swiss Alps, but it's still not Yosemite in the terms of the wildness of it. Yeah. And so we, we we bragged about it and we publicized it and it was covered. That's perfect. I just wanted to get into the Europe component now. And it's just one of the moments I love in your book. Uh, one of the chapters begins with this great quote that says, war with Switzerland, you know, and I was fascinated by this, con- this um, sort of fight, this competition, uh, you know, about the travel and, and um, the the whole movement to see America first, you know, right. come spend time, come spend your time and your money in your own land, in right. your own place. And don't go to Europe. Don't go to Switzerland. And and so I wondered if you could elaborate on that. Well, all Americans in the early 19th century were going to Europe because that that's where the ruins were. That's where the history was. Washington Irving and 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 all of our great writers would would take the European tour, yeah. and it meant usually a year or two, sometimes three years. That that's where they would go to learn to paint. Albert Bierstadt went over to paint with Turner in right. in in Europe, and they 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 went that way. And suddenly we've got this scenery and it's beautiful. And the railroads are being built. The first transcontinental railroad in 1869. I've finished in Utah, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and who's coming west? Nobody. Because everybody's still going to Europe. Mm-hmm. So the railroads want to turn this around. They say, look at all this gorgeous scenery. And they do it very quickly. And then even in World War I, of course, just before World War I, it's just it's estimated that Americans are spending five hundred million dollars a year in Europe. Well that that was huge. Even at that time. Even at that huge. Yeah. That was a hundred billion dollars. Yeah, yeah. And they're spending that in Europe, seeing Europe. And the railroads say, Come on, this way. War with Switzerland. Yeah. Let's get people to turn their eyes to America. And that's why the railroads really went gung ho for the national parks, especially in the nineteen teens and early nineteen twenties. Because that was a legitimate figure from from the United States uh, Congress and Department of Commerce yeah. that we were losing the war for the American tourists. Right. And the Europeans were not coming over here all that much because, after all, we were the provinces and Niagara Falls was now a sordid dump. <laughs> and, they didn't, and, they didn't, and they didn't want to see Yellowstone yet. They didn't know enough about it. Yeah. Now they do. Yeah. Now 40% of the visitation to Grand Canyon is 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 foreign tourists. Forty percent and forty percent at Zion and about thirty percent at, at Yellowstone. Oh wow. It's huge. Wow, that's so it's huge. interesting. They all have to come and see 
are wonders of nature. Yeah. So we won. Yeah. <laughs> but they still have a rail pass, and we don't have that yet. <laughs> I just love that idea, that war with Switzerland. It's so fun. Um, which brings me to, you know, the, the, the characters and the personalities that were involved. And I wonder, there are so many of them. But, you know, we think of uh, John Muir. We think of Hutchins, as you mentioned. And I wonder if you, do you have any favorite um, of, of the characters, the personalities that, that you've studied uh, that you'd like to highlight? Well, I'll tell you, the the person that I think is unsung is J. Horace McFarland. He mm. was a, a Pennsylvania publisher from Harrisburg, and he was the first president of the American Civic Association. And he put it all together, the exuberance and the real hard political infighting. He took his case to Washington, D.C., and he gathered around him the, the John Muirs and the and the uh, Robert Underwood Johnsons and the other major players and fought it out in the halls of Congress. And we we don't hear a lot about him. Mm -hmm. But as for characters, well, gee, you know, there there's there, there's a lot of characters. David Curry there with his firefall was a character, yeah, right? Constantly in the in the uh, constantly uh, screaming at the government to, to to let him make a greater profit. There's a lot of characters. John Muir was a character. But uh, one of the characters that I really like is is uh, is Utah's Carl Gray, the president mm. of the Union Pacific, uh. who developed this country yeah. and and had the fortitude <clears throat> to get it through a major corporate board and 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 against the advice of uh, many business people, developed this on behalf of the Union Pacific mm. and on behalf of the American people. And we don't think a lot about him. Hmm. Hmm. I think that you mentioned also that Brigham Young had been involved in the railroad uh, process, oh, yeah. and I, I didn't Young, know yeah. that. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, he insisted that the grading for the Union Pacific across Utah be done by, by Mormons, by Mormon oh, track gangs, because oh. he did not want the, the riffraff from the east <laughs> to be late to be in his state for too long. I see. Of course, it was then a territory. Yeah, right. So he and he was he was a tough bargainer. Yeah. And uh, the Union Pacific and Central Pacific did go along. Was principally the Union Pacific did go along with that. So a lot of the uh, track work through Echo Canyon and north of Salt Lake and all of that was done by Mormon workers, and the Irish workers kind of lay the final, the, mm -hmm. the ties and the rails, mm -hmm. but all the major grading and so on was done by by Mormons huh. under Brigham Young. Interesting. Turning our attention a little bit more to today for the remainder of our conversation, are there people that you really uh, respect, perhaps in the field, that are fighting the good fight right now that, that we all should know about? Well, that's a great question, and I could take it a lot of different ways. You know, we are repudiating a lot of our figures. You may have heard that John Muir has just been repudiated by the Sierra Club. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, he's been repudiated because he made comments. Oh. Well, I've seen 25,000 of John Muir's letters, and he did make a few comments about Indians and so on. But they were what we call in the legal profession stray remarks. That's not how he felt. Right. He praised the African-American soldiers that came in to protect Yosemite and the high sequoias the giant sequoias in the 1890s and early 1900s. But we are insisting now on a purity of the past, and we're never going to find it. Mm. And I think that that's tragic. So environmentalism is going somewhat now the other way. Mm. I can't really point to a hero such as uh, David Brower, who saved the Grand Canyon while executive director of the Sierra Club, who fought Lyndon Johnson to a standstill on that particular proposal. I can't really point to those kinds of people. Mm. And one of the things that I love about Southern Utah University here is to remind us that we're, we're not responsible for the past, yeah. and we can't go back and change those people. It was their battles to fight and, and their sins to cleanse themselves of, and they did. It was called the Civil War. Mm -hmm. lasted for four years, and we spent 700,000 lives deciding what kind of country we would be. Right. And I think we're getting a little bit off the off the mark when the Sierra Club says we're going to expunge John Muir from the record because he wasn't a perfect man. Well, I don't know anybody on this planet who is perfect, right. and that includes myself. Yeah, right, right. Uh, to any of our, you know, students or young people listening, um, what can we 
do? What is our role now? Um, what is your best advice uh, for us? Is it get involved? Is it volunteer? Is it visit? Is it read? Is it what's the best advice to move forward um, to preserve this legacy for the future? Well, first of all, become very aware of what it is, where it comes from, what it what it is, how it evolved. <clears throat> That's the most important thing to do. But then, yeah, get involved. Work in a park for a summer or a half year. If you're burned out on college, it's okay to take a break. You have a long life ahead of you. Take a half year or a year off. Work in a national park. And that's where I like to send young people to work in a national park. Aspire to a career in the National Park Service. We're about 50% of what we really need in the National Park Service. We need more rangers. We need more more naturalists. We need more planners. We need we need all of those things. Aspire to those careers. Mm-hmm. But become familiar. Find something in the parks that you love and become a specialist on it, where you know practically more than anybody else about what that park is and what, what its needs are. Whether it's Zion or whatever it is, learn about that park. Become an expert on it. And then do your senior thesis or your master's thesis on that. That's what I did. Mm-hmm. I went through all the way finding excuses, reasons to make the national parks my research topic. Yeah. Let's see now. You need a biography book, Al, in high school? Okay, well, we'll make that John Muir. Yeah. Okay, you need nonfiction? Okay, we'll make that the national parks. Yeah. Okay, you need literature? Okay, we'll... We'll, we'll take some novel set in the West or something like that. Mm-hmm. And you can do it that way. Mm-hmm. But we do need a lot more awareness. And that doesn't necessarily mean joining the Sierra Club now. I would write to the Sierra Club and say, I'll join again when you restore John Muir where he belongs. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's your history. Mm-hmm. And to repudiate your history, how can you expect to have a future? Right. Right. What about families? Um, you know, people perhaps listening to the radio right now thinking like, well, I, I've, I've experienced the parks as a visitor, but I might like to uh, be more involved or uh, be more of an advocate. Do you have any advice for um, people outside of the academic community um, or, or advice for people on how to travel or how to be more informed visitors? Well, simply go to the national parks. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. But don't worry if you don't see Yellowstone. You can go to a lot of other smaller national parks that are not as famous and not as well visited and have a marvelous time. And it is a wonderful family vacation. And do what my mom did, though. Back in our day, it was comic books. And she ripped them in half. You're not here to read comic books. You're here to see the scenery. <laughs> You're here to see this beautiful place. So throw those iPads so, out the window. So collect, <laughs> so collect those iPads, collect those cell phones, and yes, look out the window. What about people who maybe are like, well, yeah, I'd love to do that, but I don't really know how to build a trip like that. Are there... Are there particular places to go to? Is it just to go to the, you know, National Park Government website? What would you recommend for people who might want to start investigating some of the lesser treaded places? Well, there, 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 the internet is a marvelous tool because if you key in lesser known national parks, I'll guarantee you, you're going to get hundreds of hits Mm -hmm. and just start reading and be aware. I can tell you, uh, you know, a few of my favorites, Pinnacles in California. Uh, Crater Lake is not anywhere near as visited as is Mount Rainier or Yosemite. Olympic National Park has 3 million visitors, but it's huge. And there's a lot of ways to get into it. So you learn about that. But uh, to take the family, and here's the other secret. Just get out of the parking lot, park your car, and take a walk. Yeah. Every For every 100 yards you go, I guarantee you, visitation falls off by 50%. <laughs> and when you're one mile away from the parking lot, all you're going to see is the occasional person on a hike who, like you, is in love with the place. Yeah. And that's the way to do it. But if you want to see Old Faithful, yeah, you're going to see it with about a 1,000 people yeah. standing around for every eruption. Yeah. And one more sort of question about the future. Uh, in your, if, if you, if you had your way, if you were running the world or running the United States, what, what would the next 20 years look like for the national parks? What would you do? Well, I would, I would do what <clears throat> President Trump did. He signed a six and a half billion dollar bill to fund the infrastructure that needs redoing. It was a bipartisan bill. But it was his awareness 
They really got it through the Congress. Six and a half billion will be spent over the next nine years rehabilitating roads and trails. We have a lot of trails that are out of, uh, out of maintenance. Mm-hmm. The trails in Olympic National Park can be horrible because they've not been maintained in years. Mm-hmm. And it's a rainy place and it, uh, it erodes. So the, uh, what I would do if I were dictator, well, I would probably establish a, a whole cabinet position. On national parks. Oh. Secretary of the National Parks, not just Secretary of the Interior, and say, get these places in shape. Yeah. Get them in shape, and I'll get you the money to do it. I'll find it somewhere. That's 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 what I do if I were dictator. It's a nice <laughs> thought, Lynn. I know. Can you I see like me it. as a dictator? I think that sounds like a great idea. Trade in my kidding? tie for a uniform. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Well, you know, I think there's a lot of people who would like to see that. I think I think having, you know, somebody at cabinet level sounds fantastic. I mean, and it's also great to hear about that bill because I don't think a lot of people know about that. Right. And I think that um, you know, President Trump got gets a bad rap when it comes right. to the environmental side right. of things. So it's Right. nice to hear that that's right. going to be happening and is in place. That's fantastic. And of course, the, on the bad rap, it's for Bears Ears and yeah. Grand Staircase Escalante. But here's the thing. When President Clinton declared Grand Staircase and Barack Obama declared the Bears Ears, all they had to do was put it in the control of the National Park Service mm-hmm. and Trump would never have touched it. Right. But they left it with the Bureau of Land Management. Right. And the Bureau of Land Management is a wonderful agency, but it's not the National Park Service. Right. And the American people would have risen up and said, now just a minute here. But most people didn't know about those monuments. Right. So if I were dictator, yeah, I'd probably do a few more national monuments and, and a couple more national parks here in Utah, Grand Staircase and Bears Ears, and they'd be big and they'd be generous. And I'd, I'd buy off the people who want to develop these areas. I'd say, we can get our coal someplace else. We can get our molybdenum or whatever else you found yeah. there somewhere else. Let's save these beautiful places. I didn't realize that distinction, that that would have been, your, uh, that's absolutely right. Just making that distinction would have changed the right. whole conversation for the future. The, so. <clears throat> the monuments were under the Park Service until Mount St. Helens. And that was the first time that the the agency again of land record kept the monument. I see. But some, from the 1930s to the 1970s, they were all managed by the Park Service. After FDR agreed that they should all be managed by the Park Service, right? And then that changed, and now national monuments can be managed by. Any agency. I see. Hmm. Well, I can't believe it, but we are out of time. And I have my one last very playful question that I ask every guest. And the question is, what's turning you on this week? And the idea is that it can be anything. It could be a TV show or a movie or a food that you had. We've even had people um, talk about a, a, a brand of clothing or something. It could, it could be anything. Uh, it's just sort of a fun thing for audience to get to know you a little bit more. So my last question to you is, Al Runty, what is turning you on this week? Mm, gosh. How about my five spot that I <laughs> won down at the casino in Nevada? Score! On our way up here, my wife and I stopped off and I played my favorite Kena numbers and won $1,400. So I'm going to take everybody to dinner tonight. That is fantastic. (laughs) That absolutely should turn you on. Congratulations (laughs) on that win. (laughs) Well, with that, we will sign off. Al, thank you so much for spending the time. What a fascinating and fun conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Lynn. It was a pleasure. All right. Well, with that, we will see you next week. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.